Elhamdülillahi Rabbil Alemin Ve eşhedü en la ilahe illallah vahdehu la şerike leh Ve eşhedü enne Muhammeden abduhu ve resuluh Ve safiyuhu min halkihi ve habibuh Belleğe risalete ve edde l-emane Ve nasaha l-umme Ve keşefe Allahu bihi l-gumme Hatta atahu l-yakin Allahumma salli ve sellim Ve zid ve barik ala nabiyyi Mustafa Ve ala men da'a bi da'watihi Ve stenne bi sünnetihi ila yevmi d-din All the praise is due to Allah, Lord of the world. May the blessings be upon Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Bear witness, there is no God worthy of worship except him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I bear witness that Muhammad is the last messenger and the Prophet, peace be upon him. Brothers and sisters, I'm greeting you with the greeting of Islam. Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I always try to minimize the time of the introduction, just to give more time for the khutbah, inshallah. But the first and foremost, I want to thank Allah Azza wa Jal for giving us the opportunity, inshallah, to enjoy another Hijri year. So inshallah, after how many days we're going to start a new Hijri year? <coughs> no answers. I know we're not that knowledgeable with the Hijri calendar. So after four years from now, inshallah, four days from now, we're going to start the new Hijri year, September 11. It will, it will be kind of special Hijri year. It's 1,440. <coughs> Since Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam migrated from Mecca to Medina. And I want to thank Allah Azza wa Jal for giving our brother and sister the opportunity to go to Mecca and to perform the rituals of Hajj. And I can see some of them here. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to accept their Hajj and accept their, their effort. Allahumma ameen. To be honest with you, I have been trying to find a good topic <clears throat> that could serve the purpose of talking about Hijrah. Because month of Muharram, the first month in the Hijri year is the month of Muharram. What is the most significant incident that happened in the month of Muharram, Hijrah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam migration from Mecca to Medina. So I, I was trying to find a topic that is relevant to the Hijrah. But part of me feels that since we're still in Dhul Hijjah, why not to talk about Ibrahim alayhi salam? Because this is the month that we talk about Ibrahim and we remember his contribution to this ummah. So I have been trying to find a topic and I couldn't find a better topic than sacrifice. And you will find sacrifice <coughs> in each and every corner in the life of Ibrahim and his family. And you will find sacrifice embedded and rooted and placed in each and every corner in the migration of the Sahaba of the Muhajireen from Mecca to Medina. And this is kind of additional information. The, the story of Ibrahim and Ismail, it, it, it is mentioned in the Quran in how many times? In 12 times. Mainly in Surah Safat, or part, very close part to my heart is in Surah Safat. Oh my son, I see, in, in, I saw in the, the dream that I, I give you as a sacrifice. And you know the story. I don't want to go that far since many of you, inshallah, you know, you understand and, and you are aware of the story of Ibrahim. But whenever it comes to sacrifice, you will find that Ibrahim, alayhi salam, he surrendered the opportunity to live with his family. I myself, I enjoy spending a couple of minutes with the kids. I love going to, to, to my house. And I want to share with the kids every single aspect or activity I have every single day. So Ibrahim, he missed the opportunity to live with his family. But in return, brothers and sisters, he was given the opportunity to be the father of the prophets, right? Abu al-Anbiya. In addition to that, Ibrahim was given, alayhi salam, the opportunity to be the closest friend to whom, brothers and sisters, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whenever it comes to the Arabic language, I am biased to the Arabic language, not because I am, I am Arab, but because, because the Arabic language is the uh, language of Quran, period. And we have to stop these sectarian notions and ideas 
and consider the Arabic is a language for Bedouins and bunch of Arabs. No, it's not. Since Allah Azza wa decided to honor the Arabic language to be the language of Quran, now we, we look at the Arabic language from only this angle. We respect Arabic because it is the language of Quran and it is extremely rich language. That's why it, it was selected as, as the language of Quran. So friend in, in English is, is very clear word, but sahib or sadiq or friend, if you translate this to Arabic, oh my God, this is a jungle of information. We have rafiq, we have sahib, we have sadiq, but the highest level is khalil. All in English they are friends. Khalil is the one that you share with him all your secrets. You trust him like the back of your hand. So Ibrahim, he missed the opportunity to live with his family and spend time with him. But at the same time, he was given the opportunity to be Khalilullah, the nearest human being to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And look at his wife, Sarah, Sarah in Arabic. Sarah, she was childless. She, f she missed the opportunity to, get, to give birth. And of course, it's a hard decision for any wife to ask her husband to get married to another wife. It's, it's very hard in, in each and every culture. So Sarah, she asked Ibrahim, yeah, Ibrahim, you know what? It's time to get married. I cannot give you the kid. The funny part is, how old was Ibrahim at this moment of truth? 100 years old. He was 100 years old. So Sayyidah Sarah, Sayyidah Sarah was being patient and patient and patient for like 80 years till it was the time for her, you know what, Ibrahim, go. But I have a condition. Don't, you don't have to look for a wife. I have your wife. And she married him to whom, brothers and sisters? To her slave. The Egyptian slave, her name is Hajar. But in return, she was given what? Ishaq. After the marriage between Ibrahim and Hajar, subhanallah, gift from Allah Azza wa Jal, she was given the opportunity to be a mother again. And she, he, she called her son Ishaq. In English, Isaac. If you look at Ibrahim again, after 80 years waiting for, for a kid, Allah Azza wa Jal takes something from you and he gives you something better in return. This is the taken lesson today. Ibrahim, he was waiting for the kid for like 80, 85 years. And imagine, you receive an instruction from Allah. No, you go and dump your kid in, in the desert. And he went and he fulfilled the promise. So he missed the opportunity to live with Ismail. But he was given in return what, brothers and sisters? Ishaq. And in many books, they mention that whenever Ibrahim returned back to Sarah, she asked him, where is Ismail? And where is Hajar? You know, I received an instruction and order from Allah Azza wa Jal to, to you know, abandon them and surrender them at the desert. So she told him, Ya Ibrahim, Wallahi la, la yudayyana Allah. And she gave him the glad tiding. I am pregnant. And she gave birth to whom? To Ishaq. And if you look at, at Hajar, in, in our culture, the second wife is not a pleasant idea. It's not a good idea to have a second wife. But Sayyid Hajar was the only second wife that she was honored everywhere. Imagine, imagine the life of Hajar. She, was, she missed the opportunity to have a good life, normal life in Egypt, and she was taken as a slave. In return, she was given the opportunity to be a slave where? In a prophet's house, Ibrahim. Overnight, she was given the, another opportunity and another privilege to be whom? A prophet's wife. Suddenly, out of the blue, she was asked to go to the desert and live with a newborn baby. But at the end of the day, she asked Ibrahim only one question. Yeah, Ibrahim, 
Allah amaraka bi hadha. Did Allah Azza wa Jal order you to do, to do this? He said yes. So Allah will take care of us, period. Don't worry about us. And Ibrahim, he left. And now, and Abu Ahmad was in, in Mecca making Hajj. And many of our brothers and sisters, everyone goes to Mecca to perform Hajj and Umrah. He or she must follow the footsteps of whom, brothers and sisters? Hajar, alayhi salam. Hajar, alayhi salam. Running. Look at her resilience. Running between Safa and Marwa, looking for water for the newborn baby. Everybody, till the day of judgment, is following the footsteps of, of this great woman, Hajar. And if you look at the sacrifice in life of even Ismail, you know, he has two tribulations in his life. Very young newborn baby, abandoned in the desert. And after he became a teenager, his dad asking him to give him as a sacrifice. Big tribulations in his life. But he was given in return, what brothers and sisters? To build Kaaba, to build Medina, to build, to build Mecca, and to be a prophet. Above all, in my understanding, Ismail was extremely knowledgeable. Why? Because at that time, the, the great civilization in Yemen, may Allah Azza wa protect our brothers and sisters in Yemen, they have, or they had at that time, an old dam called Ma'rib. Said the Ma'rib. And there was a big damage and they lost their homes. And they've been waiting and waiting and waiting for another civilization till they hear that there is a place in Mecca, there is a water well over there. So all the tribes, they moved. And Ismail was exposed to different civilizations and language and religions. And he was extremely knowledgeable. At the end of the day, Ibrahim was willing to give Ismail as a sacrifice. And even Ismail was willing to give himself as a sacrifice. Remember, Allah Azza wa takes something from you, but he saves something better for you. Again, Allah Azza wa takes something from you, but he saves and he gives you something better in return. So in return, Allah Azza wa has bestowed the highest, the highest honor on Ibrahim and Ismail. And they became, and they, like my brother mentioned last Jum'ah, every single prayer we say while making tashahud, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad, kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala Ali Ibrahim. How many, by the way, how many prophets do we have as an ummah? 25. In the Quran, you will find 25 prophets. In one surah, this surah, it mentions the highest number of prophets in one surah. What's the name of the surah? Surah Al-An'am. 18 prophets in one surah. Abu Zarr al-Ghufari, he was asking the Prophet how many prophets we have? In the Quran, we have 25. He told him, we have, there are 325 prophets. They were sent to the, to the mankind. 325. Among all of those brothers and sisters, each and every single prayer, we as Muslims, we have to say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala Ali Ibrahim. This family, brothers and sisters, you will find sacrifice in each and every corner in their life. If I want to go to the hijrah, you will find sacrifice in each and every single corner. And what is a hijrah? Hijrah, migration of Muslims from Mecca to Medina. They fled Mecca going to Medina. Migration from weakness. Migration from ignorance. Migration from transgression. Migra migration from adultery and bad behavior and bad manners. Going where? To light? To knowledge? To faith? To utmost happiness from Mecca to Medina. But look at Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam while migrating from Mecca to Medina. The last sight he gave to Mecca, what did he say? Remember the hadith? Allah takes something from you, but he saves something better for you. He looks at Mecca and he said, Wallahi, innaki la ahabbu bilad Allahi illallah. I swear by his name that you are the most beloved land to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
واحب بلاد الله الي and you are the most beloved land even to me ولولا ان اهلك اخرجوني منك ما خرجت منك ابدا if your people didn't push me away and force me out of mecca i would have never left mecca so allah azza wa jal takes from him the opportunity to live in mecca to live with his family and with his tribe but in return allah azza wa jal he saves something better from muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that was the spark brother and sister that built the muslim civilization and the muslim ummah until now 1440 years after the hijrah of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in sacramento california i stand here to mention and to repeat the teachings of this great man sallallahu alaihi wasallam the hijrah was the spark that built the muslim ummah until now alhamdulillah we're proud muslims with all the troubles around us with all the challenges we're proud muslims but look at him sallallahu alaihi wasallam after years from hijrah exactly 80 years i'm going to prove that allah azza wa jal he saved something better for you 80 years after hijrah that was the battle of hunayn after fath makkah many people they entered islam at that time the muslim army for the first time ever they were 12000 people and sallallahu alaihi wasallam after you know the ghanaim the precious stuff that the army collects after after each and every uh, you know battle sallallahu alaihi wasallam he collects all the ghanaim and he gives all the ghanaim to whom to the people from makkah newly come to islam So the Ansar, they gathered in Medina and they had this conversation. Now Muhammad ibn Abdullah, he returns back to his tribe. He gives his tribe many favors. He even forgot to share those bounties with us. Is this fair? He came to us poor and needy like all the Muhajireen. And now this is the result. This is the reward from Prophet of Allah to forget us and to distribute all the priceless stuff on the Meccan people. So Sa'd ibn Abada, he can see the fitna growing in, in, in Medina. So he went to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, there is a situation here. You have to pay attention. What happened to ibn Abada, one of the greatest leaders in, 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 in Medina? He told him, you know there is something in our hearts now it's time for you to give all the bounties to your people in mecca that we have been fighting since 13 years or or 20 years now you forget us he told him who said that he told him the, the, the ansar your people the, from medina and what do you think ya sad i am one of the leaders and i adopt i adopt the same opinion So gather, let everybody gather here. I want to see all of them. So they came, and Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he gave them like a lengthy lecture, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's very long. I'm going to stick to the last part to prove that Allah Azza wa Jal takes something from you and he saves something better for you. What did he say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? أَفَلَا تَرْضَوْنَ يَا مَعْشَرَ الْأَنْصَارِ أن يذهب الناس الناس إلى بيوتهم بالشاة والبعير وترجعوا إلى رحالكم برسول الله Wouldn't you be satisfied that those people that they newly you know, adopt, adopting Islam this newcomer to Islam wouldn't you be satisfied that those people will go home with sheep and goats and livestock and world position and you go home with Prophet of Allah Wouldn't you accept this equation? Let them go with, with the she and, and, and sheep and goats. I am coming back home with you. If all people took a path and you people, the Ansar, the Ansar they took another path Wallahi, by Allah I swear, I would take the same path like the Ansar. If it were not for the Hijrah, 
I would, I would have been one of the Ansar. ولولا الهجرة لكنت رجلا من الأنصار. So eight years before this brother and sister صلى الله عليه وسلم was extremely upset leaving Mecca. But after eight years Allah Azza Jal was saving something better for him which was to build this civilization and he bestowed the love of the Ansar and the love of Medina in his heart صلى الله عليه وسلم. And in the same context Umm Salama who knows Umm Salama? Umm Salama was one of the Prophet ﷺ wife. As a matter of fact, she was the last wife, of course, beside, beside Aisha, and in some narrations, even after Aisha, to, to die. She passed away after the assassination of Al-Husayn radiallahu anha, which took, took place in Muharram. So Umm Salama, she was married to Hind bint Umayyah al-Makhzumi. She, she was married to uh, 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 Abu Salama. And at that time, it's time migration from Mecca to Medina. And her tribe, you know what? You're not going with Muhammad. You're not going with Muhammad to Medina. You have to stay here. So Abu Salama's tribe, they had a quarrel and a fight and argument with her, with her tribe. And they insisted on taking her. Okay, if you want to stay, we're going to take the boy. And you know the very famous story. They, they pulled the kid from right and left till his arm was severed. And in many narrations, he passed away. So imagine the situation. She was missed the opportunity to live with her husband. And she saw the death of her own kid in front of her eyes. And she went. He went to Medina and she stayed. Every single day. Every single day. She used to go to the mountains and make dua, Ya Allah, gather me with Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Every single day, Ya Allah, gather me with Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Till one of her tribes, he felt bad for her. Guys, let her go. After a year of this torture and suffering, let her go. Allah Azza takes from her the opportunity to live with her husband and with her kid. But look, he saves for her what? She went to, exactly, she went to Medina, and subhanAllah, a few days later, Abu Salama passed away. She was waiting for this moment for a year. And after she reached Medina, a few, few days later, he passed away. And imagine, who married her at the end of the day? Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Allah takes from you something you feel is very important to you. A kid, may Allah protect all our kids. Or job. Or an opportunity. And we lose our mind. We lose our faith completely. But bear in your mind that Allah Azza wa Jal, He saves something better for you. And it, it leads me to a personal experience. And everyone here is very close to, to, to our family. And you know, most of you know that you know, my wife and I, we lost a kid. And you know the Arab culture, we had a baby girl and after five years, everybody was waiting for the boy. Wallahi, like every family gathering, where is the boy, where is the boy? One year, two years, three years, till five years. Where is the boy? You guys, are you guys okay? You guys, I don't have the, the boy's machine in house. I don't have the machine. So just make dua for us. That's all what, you, even don't ask me. And then Allah Azza wa Jal, he granted us a baby boy. Few, few hours later, he passed away. So I took the boy and, you know, the time to, to prepare him for, for, you know, for all the, to go to the graveyard and all this uh, drama. And, you know, as, as, as any dad, even waiting for five years for a boy or just out of the blue, you know, everybody was, it's a heartbreaking incident. May Allah Azza wa Jal protect you and all our kids, Allahumma Ameen. So at that time, I remember quite well that one of the brothers, he came, uh, he's not, he's a pharmacist, he's not very close friend to me. So he came to me and he held me from the shoulder and he said, the ayah in Surah Al-Kahf that we repeat every day, لا تدري لعل الله يحدث بعد ذلك أمرا We repeat, we, we recite Surah Al-Kahf every Friday, theoretically. So you never know, may Allah Azza wa Jal in the future will change matters. And will save something better for you. 
as if the first time for me to, to, you know, to hear this ayat. لا تدري لعل الله يحدث بعد ذلك أمره. So I, I took the baby and I, 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 I drove my car. So one of my uncles he insisted on giving me a ride because our graveyard is like four hours away from Cairo. And that time, my wife, she insisted on giving the delivery in Egypt to be you know, around her family. Long story short, I put the, the kid at the back seat. Allah is my witness. So I insisted in driving him alone. So my uncle came to me, you know, let, let me give a ride. You're not mentally stable to drive all the way for four hours. I told him, please, let me spend some time with my kid. He told me, I, ca I cannot do that. And he insisted on driving me. And all the, all the time I was in the passenger seat, I was looking at him for like four hours. And whenever we entered our village and we opened the grave and we put him inside, I decided not to go outside. <clears throat> so one of the imams, he, de he, ent he decided and he insisted on entering the grave with me. And he told me, Shif, you're wasting your time. I told him, I can't leave him. I just can't. I can't leave him. I know. Well, I'm, I'm, I can't say I'm, I'm a believer, but I can't just go away and close the door and, you know, mission accomplished. I can't. So he reminded me with ayat in surat. Bismillah. He reminded me ayat in surat al-Kahf uh, too. Remember the, the story between Musa and uh, al-Khidr? And Musa, he wanted to, to follow al-Khidr. And al-Khidr told him, but you have not enough knowledge to follow me. You, have not, you don't have enough knowledge. So how can you follow me? He told him, if you insist on following me, don't ask questions. لا تسألني عن شيء حتى أحدث لك منه ذكرى until I explain everything to you. And then he saw uh, uh, Al-Khidr killing a boy. Now, at this moment, he lost his mind. You're killing an innocent soul. This is a horrendous act. And uh, so Al-Khidr told him, okay, now it's end of your journey. Since you're not a patient believer, let's stop here. I'm going to explain to you. So the Imam was reminding me, وَكَانَ أَبُوهُمَا صَالِحًا The parents of, of this kid, that the Al-Khidr, the wise man, the righteous man, the piety, the pious man, he killed, وَكَانَ أَبُوهُمَا صَالِحًا His parents, they were extremely good people. فخشينا. Look at look at the word, Allah Azza wa Jal, Lord of the world. He says, فخشينا. We fear. We fear that this kid will give his parents a hard time. So he told me, I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make you and your wife good parents, and to grant you in the future, inshallah, better kids that they will give you. Good time, not hard time. So Allah Azza wa Jal, brothers and sisters, He takes from us something, but in return, He gives us something more precious and way better. Ask Allah Azza wa Jal to accept our dua and to accept our salah. Raise your hands and ask for forgiveness. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa an la ilaha illallah wa la sharika lah, wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh. Allah Azza wa Jal takes from us something very important, we feel that is very important, but he saves something better for us. 11 Hijri, Abu Bakr Siddiq decided to start a campaign to conquer the Persian Empire. And he passed away. And this campaign lasted till 23 Hijri, during the Khilafah of Umar ibn al-Khattab. At that time, the last king of Persia, his name is Yazdgar. He fled. He escaped. He vanished. And he left three beautiful daughters. So the Muslims, they took everything in Persia and they sent everything to Washington, D.C. at that time, which was Medina. 
At that time, Ali ibn Abi Talib was the main judge in Medina. So he saw three, you know, like good looking girls. So he asked, who are they? So he was told that they are princess, they are daughters of Yazdegerd. So he said, Anzilu nasa manazilahum. That's how Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us. We have to treat people based on their status. We cannot take those three girls as slaves. I, I cannot do that. I have to use my authority as the judge in the Medina to free all of them. So he gathered them and they said, thanks. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to be like normal people, not slaves. So he, he told them, I have an advice to you guys. Find husband for each and every one of you. Don't live in Medina like this. So girls are always, whenever it comes, you know, to the, the managed part of their life, they are extremely smart and intelligent. And instead of saying, okay, you know, how about you're the judge? How about to recommend good, good boys or good husband? Of course, they will, they will never say that. They said, okay, give us some time to decide. So he smiled and he and said, but you don't know anybody here in Medina. Don't worry about us, we'll know. And after a couple of weeks, they came to him. Ya Ali, who is the Khalifa at that time? He said, Umar ibn Khattab. What is the name of his son? Abdullah ibn Umar ibn Khattab. So one of them, she raised her, I, I want to marry Abdullah Umar ibn Khattab. Son of the Khalifa. Second one, she said, who was the previous Khalifa? Abu Bakr, who was one of his sons? Muhammad. I want to marry Muhammad. And the last smart girl, she asked Ali, and what's the name of your son? He said, I have two, two boys, Hassan and Hussein. Who is the younger? Al Hussein. I want to marry Al Hussein. Extremely intelligent and smart girls. So they got married to Abdullah and Muhammad in Abi Bakr. And the last one, Al Hussein. Hussein ibn Ali. And they gave birth to whom? Zainul al Abidin ibn Ali, by the way. Zainul ibn Abidin ibn Ali. Abdin ibn Abdin Ali. And Muhammad and Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib, they have, they have a very, you know, specific and, you know, unique relation. Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr and Ali ibn Abi Talib. Muhammad, his mom is Asma ibn Umayyis. And whenever she got married to Abu Bakr, he told her, you're, you're extremely special to me. Out of all my sons and daughters, if Allah Azza wa Jal grants us a boy, I'm going to call him after Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because you're extremely special to me. And he called him Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. And so after Abu Bakr passed away, Ali ibn Abi Talib decided to marry Asma ibn Umayyis. And he took Muhammad in his house and he raised him. And he, when he became the Khalifa, he sent him to Egypt to be the governor of Egypt. Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr Siddiq. This is our history, brothers and sisters. But the problem is, the first word we as Ummah, we received is Iqra, right? Read. And the least thing we do in this life is to read. This is our history. Open the books. So Muhammad, imagine, imagine the, the situation of the girl. She was a princess in Persia. Royal family, royal blood, say to so. And then taken as a slave. So Allah Azza wa Jal takes from her something, but he saves something better for her. And suddenly she became a Muslim and married to one of the great Tabi'een, Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. And now, after being a slave, now she is the wife of the governor of Egypt. Allah Azza wa Jal takes something from you, but he saves something better for you. And part of the fitna, I, I don't want to go that far, this part of our black history, but we have to stand up like men and you know, acknowledge this part of our black history. Muawiyah at that time, he sent unbeatable a commander who knows Egypt like back of his hand, who conquered Egypt before. What's his name? Amr ibn al-As. Amr, go to Egypt, take over Egypt, Kill Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. And he did. May Allah Azza wa Jal, and this is my teaching. I make dua for the one who kills and the one who got killed. I make dua for Amr ibn al-As 
and dua for Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. It's not my area to interfere and say, no, it's his mistake. No, it's his mistake. No, no, this is, this is not our territory at all. So, Abdul Rahman ibn Abi Bakr Siddiq, he saw his, 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 his brother, his blood brother being killed in front of him. So he decided to save whom? Al Qasim ibn Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr Siddiq. And by the way, brothers and sisters, let me put this straight. 75%, if I'm not mistaken, of our knowledge, the hadith that was narrated by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa about his personal life, the way he prays, the way he makes wudu, the way he used to sleep, he used to eat, we owe Al-Qasim ibn Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr Siddiq all the knowledge we as Ummah, we enjoy today because of this tabi'i. Al-Qasim ibn Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr Siddiq, he was taken from Egypt, after he, he became an orphan, and he was sent to Medina. So Abdul Rahman ibn Abi Bakr, he was, he, 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 he's, he's narrating, I was looking for a safe place to put my nephew. Because everybody was, was looking for Al-Qasim, because he's son of Muhammad, seven years old kid. And I couldn't find a place better than what? The Prophet's house, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Who was at the Prophet's house at that time? Aisha bint Abi Bakr. Look at Aisha. She was, she missed the opportunity to live with, with, with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She, you know, just a couple of years. And whenever he passed away, she was late to years. Forget about she got married at eight and nine. I totally disagree with this. She got married 17, 18 years old. And whenever Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he passed away, she was like 29 years old. And do you know that all the Prophet's wives, they are not allowed to do what after he passed away? To marry again. So imagine, she, she was childless, she missed the opportunity to marry again, and now it's the end of her story. Allah Azza takes something from her, and he saves something better for her. And suddenly, Abdul Rahman, her brother, he opened the door, and he entered with whom? Al-Qasim ibn Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, her nephew. And he told her, Ya Aisha, take care of this kid. And he spent seven years in, in her house. He, was, he used to, to sleep very close, very close to the bed of whom, brothers and sisters? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he lost the opportunity to live with his family, with his mother and with his father, but he was given the opportunity to be raised in the house of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with one third of the knowledge of Muslim ummah, with whom? With Aisha. Radiallahu anha. And one day he told her, Ya Amma, my aunt, can I have a look at the grave of my grandf grandfather Abu Bakr? And the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So she removed the carpet and she removed everything and she told him, here Abu Bakr and here Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and here is Omar. 13 years old kid. And if our kids at this time you know, we, we give them all the electronics in this life. Just spend time and, you know, get away from our shoulders. <clears throat> so he asked her, Amma, my aunt, how can I reach this highest level? How can I do that? To be like all those great people. She told him, you have only one path. So he said, you got my attention now. Tell me. Knowledge. And whenever he became 15 years old, Abdul Rahman came to her house. Ya Aisha, you did a great job with this boy. Now it is time for him to spend more time with the scholars in Medina. Whenever he became 20 years old, Al Qasim ibn Muhammad ibn Abdullah, he became one of the most famous seven scholars in Medina. And let me close by this. He used to say, Ma mana'a minni shay'an, Allah Azza wa Jal. ما منع مني شيئا منذ خلقني إلا أراني حكمته في المنع الله أكبر الله عز وجل says القاسم since he created me in the first place he used to prevent me from obtaining things and acquiring things and doing things like every, each and every one of us but every time Allah عز وجل prevents me from doing something or, 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 or from acquiring something Every single time he shows me 
his wisdom and his mercy behind this preventation. إِلَّا أَرَانِي رَحْمَتَهُ فِي الْمَنْعَ Brothers and sisters, this is the month of sacrifice, month of Dhul Hijjah. And again, month of Muharram is the month of Hijrah and month of sacrifice. I think it's time for us to sit with our kids and to read more and more and more about the legacy of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and about the, the teachings of him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and about the different cycle of of the migration from Mecca to Medina. Allahumma aghfir lana dhunubana wa israfana fi amrina wa thabbit ala al-haqi aqdamana wa ansurna ala al-qawm al-kafirin. Allahumma ansuri al-allahumma allahumma aghfir al-ansari wa al-muhajirin. Allahumma aghfir al-ansari wa al-muhajirin. اللهم اغفر للأنصار والمهاجرين واجمعنا بهم يوم القيامة يا رب العالمين اللهم تقبل صلاتنا وتقبل دعاءنا واغفر للمسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات إنك سميع قريب مجيب الدرعوات يا رب العالمين وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله وقوموا إلى صلاتكم يرحمكم الله